What's up guys, it's gonna be a real quick intro before we get into this video. There's gonna be three uploads coming your guys' way spread throughout a few days of a podcast that I did about a year ago, over a year ago, called the Ruthless Discussions Podcast. It was a ruthless aggression podcast that I did on a separate channel that I was starting to build up before we converted this channel back to just an all wrestling channel. But I wanted to re-upload those podcasts to this channel and let that be the kickoff to some brand new ruthless aggression content that I wanna make for you guys. And the future content won't necessarily be podcast style i just want to do some ruthless aggression videos man my favorite era in wrestling history the era i grew up on i just want to make some videos talking about the ruthless aggression era so let me know down below in the comments what do you guys want to see me talk about what should we go back and watch look at discuss let me know but i got three podcasts coming your guys' way one is the first smackdown under the wwe umbrella after the change from wwf to wwe we have another discussing the entire 2006 king of the ring tournament and then the third one will be talking about the legendary ovw class from 2002 so you'll be watching the same intro and i'll be re-uploading all three of those and then after that we're going to get to some brand new ruthless aggression content right here on the no nation wrestling youtube channel so enjoy these podcasts from about a year ago and stay tuned for more stuff i hope you enjoy it i'll see you guys soon peace The 2006 King of the Ring Tournament and how it affected the rest of the year for Friday Night SmackDown. The final stories for some of these superstars in this tournament, the launching pad to World Heavyweight Championship gold for one superstar in particular, and a pretty entertaining tournament to my needs all in between. We're going to talk about it here tonight on the Ruthless Discussions podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. Let's kick this thing off. Ruthless Aggression! Alrighty, what is up nation and welcome back to the Ruthless Discussions podcast episode numero 4. This week we are going to be discussing the 2006 King of the Ring Tournament. Now, I was feeling, you know, uh, or trying to feel it out, trying to think of stuff, you know, what I wanted to talk about this week on the podcast. And I said last week that on an upcoming episode, I'm going to talk about the 2003 Judgment Day pay-per-view, and I believe that's going to be next week's podcast. But I wanted to do something in between instead of just jumping to yet another show uh, review three weeks in a row. And I thought this would be something cool since it was a whole tournament stretched out for basically a month. We started on April 14th, 2006. We ended on uh, Judgment Day, which was, I believe, the 20-something of uh, May that year. I don't have the exact date uh, listed, but I watched the whole thing, uh, every single match, and I thought it was uh, a, a nice little time period to, to talk about and something different, like I said. Also, I wanted to pick something from the month of May, uh, just because we're in the month of May, and obviously this started in April uh, of that year, but, you know, it stretched to Judgment Day. And I, I gotta be honest, man, my overall thoughts before we really start breaking stuff down, we get into the podcast, I really enjoyed this tournament, you know. On the outside looking in, when you see the bracket, it might not look like the most exciting tournament, um, even though you really have some good matches right off in the first round. Like, without knowing anything, like, if, if it's April 14th, SmackDown just started, and uh, April 14th, 2006, that is, and SmackDown just started, and you're just seeing the bracket for the first time. You got Kurt Angle and Randy Orton in the first round, which sells the whole thing. I don't even need to explain anymore. You got Booker T and Matt Hardy, which uh, not a lot of matches, at least to my knowledge, throughout those two men's career between each other, so that's a different matchup. You got Bobby Lashley and Mark Henry, which I believe they may have, may have faced before this matchup. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if this was their first ever meeting, but still, you know, it was a big match for the time. Uh, and then you had Chris Benoit versus Finley, which I think is another match that just sells itself to, you know, just snot nose in your face wrestlers uh, just beating the hell out of each other. And that's exactly what it ended up being. So on the outside looking in, uh, you know, in my opinion, it looks good. But I could see, you know, other people might be like, eh, you know, it's not the most exciting tournament. Two weeks their own, but I was really pumped up. And as we were going throughout this tournament, man, I really enjoyed it. You got some really different matches in here. Uh, Booker T and Matt Hardy really surprised me. It was better than I thought we're gonna thought it was gonna be. Uh, we're gonna talk about that. It honestly, may have been my favorite match uh, of the whole first round. And then just you know a nice progression throughout the tournament. There's a nice story told from the beginning of the tournament to the end of the tournament. And uh, like I said in the in the intro to this podcast, it really set up uh, a lot of things to come. You know, this is the final. Uh, you know, story on SmackDown, really, uh, or at least kicked off the final stories for Randy Orton before he 
got suspended and then moved to Monday Night Raw uh, post-suspension. Then we had the final story really kicking off for Kurt Angle on SmackDown before in the month of June he would move to ECW. Um, and some of the other things in here, like Chris Benoit, this is one of his final stories uh, before he went on like a three, four month hiatus on SmackDown, didn't come back till I believe it was the SmackDown after No Mercy that year. Um, he was out from, I think, June, because I, I or, or late May, May, late May, early June, whenever it was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments here, uh, on YouTube, but Mark Henry took him out, I remember that, and then uh, I believe, he, I, I don't think, I'm, to my knowledge, I don't think he was injured, I think he was just taking a break at the time, uh, because, you know, if you go back and look, I don't know when the last time Benoit took a break, probably 02 when he was out with an injury, and then he was, you know, full schedule ever since, uh, but I think you got wrote off television there, uh, and then didn't, like I said, come back till I think the, the Friday night SmackDown after No Mercy that year, uh, where he defeated Mr. Kennedy for the United States Championship, so it's one of his, his last things before he moves on, uh, a lot of good stuff, and, uh, this King of the Rings set up a lot of, uh, stuff, like I said, that would move you into the future of Friday night SmackDown in the second half of 2006, you know, we're coming off hot, you know, this is two weeks after WrestleMania 22, uh, this tournament kicks off. We're moving into the SmackDown exclusive Judgment Day pay-per-view in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Well, I didn't write down the date. That's the only thing I didn't do. Uh, I wrote down all the what is the, uh, the the locations, the dates for all the first-round matches uh, besides Judgment Day because I'm an idiot. But <laughs> this took place May 21st, uh, so one week uh, and and. Well, less less than uh, excuse me, one week the time this podcast is going up. But uh, May twenty first, two thousand six, uh, U.S. Airways Center in Phoenix, Arizona, is when we had the finals of the King of the Ring tournament. So we're gonna run through the whole thing. Like I said, I uh, watched the whole thing. I got some notes here to talk about the matches themselves, just some overall storylines, things, some things I personally, honestly, would have liked to see uh, from SmackDown that year. And uh, we're just gonna get into it. Uh, but anyway, before we get into things here on YouTube, make sure you guys like, comment, and subscribe to the brand new Ruthless Discussions YouTube channel that you're watching this podcast on right now. But if you are listening, as I look down at my microphone, uh, be sure to leave me a good old five-star review on any of the audio platforms. We're currently on Anchor, Spotify, Google, uh, still struggling to get it on Apple. I don't, I just, I don't know what the problem is. Like I've been talking about the last couple of weeks. I don't know why I can't get it up there. Uh, it's just, I, again, it's, it's their end, not mine. So I'm just kind of keep checking back, keep checking back, just trying to get it fixed. But eventually the podcast will be up on Apple, but be sure to do that support on, uh, you know, myself here, the Noah Nation, and uh, let's keep growing this thing, man. It's a brand new Ruthless Discussions YouTube channel. We're here every single Sunday uh, talking about the Ruthless Aggression Era, uh, which I love so dearly, and then we're going to be doing, you know, bonus content as well uh, throughout the week. You know, we're slowly but surely getting started, but I got some good ideas for the YouTube channel that we're going to dive into, some future episodes, and even, like I said, just some future content that won't even be full podcast episodes. It'll just be maybe 15, 20 minute discussion videos that I'm just going to post, uh, you know, eventually, but we'll get to all that. So definitely be sure to subscribe here on the YouTube channel. I would greatly appreciate it. I uh, definitely am giving you guys, uh, your bank for your buck. If you, <laughs> if you will, um, in exchange for that, uh, subscription, but anyways, guys, let's get in to the 2006 King of the Ring tournament. We'll be looking at my notes here off screen, so if I'm not looking at the camera, that is why. But like I said, this thing kicked off on April the 14th uh, on, on Friday Night SmackDown. It was the first King of the Ring tournament since 2002, uh, where the pay-per-view had it were, when it had its final uh, pay-per-view where Brock Lesnar won. They did not acknowledge it all. They <laughs> Plenty of times throughout uh, this tournament, they were talking about past winners, uh, and they basically just named the same people over and over again, Bret Hart, Triple H, Stone Cold. Edge, they really didn't mention anybody uh, besides that because Lesnar won in 02 and he was obviously gone uh, by 04. Billy Gunn won in 99, I think. Um, they didn't mention that uh, or 2000. I don't know. The point is, they only uh, you know mentioned a, a select few that they wanted to mention uh, throughout the lineage and history of King of the Ring. Uh, but yeah, it's the first time we we're getting the King of the Ring tournament, a SmackDown exclusive, which honestly would have been really cool uh, that year if they did a 16. Uh, man bracket instead of eight and then did you know eight from smackdown eight from raw and then uh honestly it would have been sick if instead of even bringing back the pay-per-view if they would have did it maybe during the summertime and uh had the finals at like SummerSlam or something i think that would have been cool um but obviously you know that messes up a bunch of storylines that in retrospective we know of now but at the time uh they could have you know wrote around that but i think that would have been a great idea you know you could have had these same eight guys uh well if it happened during the summer or you know this time whatever uh let's just say these same eight guys for smackdown and then eight from raw i uh, definitely could have put together a fire uh 16 man bracket uh back in 2006 i think that would have been great but it was a smackdown exclusive teddy long uh play a play a play brought it back that year and uh, like i said we kicked it off april 14th in green bay 
Wisconsin. We actually had a uh, segment open the show. I wanted to uh, watch the first few minutes because I knew it was the first, uh, you know, night of the King of the Ring tournament. I wanted to see if there's any, uh, you know, promos or anything or whatnot. There actually was a segment that kicked off the show with the King of the Ring, uh, you know, crown or crown, the scepter, the robe, and the uh, throne uh, on like a nice red rug in the middle of the ring. Booker T came out and uh, they immediately pretty much teased. Uh, the finals from here, and I don't want to say gave it away. I mean, they kind of did. Um, I, I mean, maybe at the time you could have guessed it if you were smart, but I mean, at the same time, you had Kurt Angle, Randy Orton here, Mark Henry was hot at the time, so hot at the time, excuse me. So there's definitely other options in here, but they teased pretty much right away what the finals was going to be, and that being Booker T and Bobby Lashley. Booker T came out uh, and just started, you know, put, putting everything on, acting like he was already the king. And Booker T was, you know, literally already played into the fact that he was going to be going to be the king and going to be royalty literally from the get-go of this tournament. He didn't even wait to win it, which I thought was hilarious. Booker T had many uh, funny moments, especially near the end uh, at Judgment Day when he won <laughs> the King of the Ring. Uh, but he's basically just putting everything on. Bobby Lashley came down. Uh, I believe he speared him uh, in the ring, and that was just it. They were just kind of setting it up, you know, like I said, teasing the finals uh, of the tournament that would come over a month later uh, at Judgment Day. But anyway, we go back to Kurt Angle and Randy Orton, which was uh, the main event that night. Uh, obviously, these two <clears throat> were feuding, uh, you know, previously at WrestleMania 22 along with Rey Mysterio for the World Heavyweight Championship. Again, this is the second smack down after WrestleMania 22 that year. I believe Ray, no, Ray didn't, I think, did Ray wrestle on the SmackDown? I'm not sure. Angle Norton was the main event, uh, but Ray, I remember go, when I was going through these SmackDowns, see, this is when he faced, like, Mark Henry and lost to Mark Henry and lost to Great Khali. This was his world championship run where he basically just lost every week, unfortunately. Uh, definitely would be, that's a good idea. Maybe we'll do that in a future video or something here on the uh, YouTube channel, maybe rebooking uh, Ray Mysterio's world title run. I think it'd be pretty cool, but anyway, obviously Kurt Angle, Randy Orton, like I said, they had heat between each other post WrestleMania 22. Um, so this is their third match, I believe. Well, this was their first of three matches in 2006 because um, they were, you know, like I said, had heat with each other from WrestleMania 22, but they didn't really kick off their feud between just themselves, I'd say, uh, until now or the week before because they were talking about on commentary. I believe there might have been some exchange, but I obviously didn't watch uh, or go back and watch just, you know, a promo or something like that, but. Kurt Angle and Orton had a feud um, in 2006, and I believe this was their first one-on-one -on -one match um, between each other. They might have wrestled one-on-one -on -one before WrestleMania 22. I'm not exactly sure off the top of my head, uh, but I know they had this match, which, uh, you know, as we'll, we'll get to here, wrote Randy Orton off uh, for, this was April 14th, I believe he came, at, came back right before, literally, uh, One Night Stand, so I think he was suspended like 60 days. I believe that would be 60 days if you looked at the dates uh, because of, I believe it was steroids. So he was suspended from there, and they wrote him off television. That kind of kicked off the Kurt Angle-Randy Orton feud, um, even though it didn't kind of pick up until, uh, you know, post the suspension. And I got to assume if Randy Orton did get suspended, it probably would have been Kurt Angle versus Randy Orton at Judgment Day instead of Kurt Angle versus Mark Henry, because uh, Kurt Angle versus Mark Henry kind of, I don't want to say was, like, thrown together, uh, but kind of came together shortly, like, two weeks after this uh, on SmackDown in London. Uh, but I got to assume Kurt Angle and Randy Orton was probably on the card uh, for, for Judgment Day that year, which would have been better, obviously, than Kurt Angle versus Mark Henry, even though, from what I remember, pretty sure they had a good matchup, and I feel like Kurt Angle, I actually still have the Judgment Day Wikipedia card up. I know Kurt Angle, no, no, Mark Henry won that match by a uh, countout. I was about to say, I think Kurt Angle won by countout, but Mark Henry actually won uh, by countout at WrestleMania, or excuse me, at Judgment Day. Uh, but yeah, anyway, this is the first match of their feud, um, and like I said, I think they, they probably would have, you know, continued it on post this if Orton didn't get suspended, but they picked it right back up when Orton did come back from suspension, and uh, that's when they had the match at One Night Stand. Uh, since Kurt Angle moved to ECW, they had Randy Orton show back up on Raw. He had moved to Raw. I think he might even explain it, like his contract SmackDown expired. He's joined, joining Raw again uh, after he had moved to SmackDown the previous year in the draft officially. Uh, but yes, and then they had the one night stand match, which Kurt Angle won, uh, and then they had the rematch at Vengeance just a couple weeks later, which Randy Orton won. All those matches were great, man. This one was a good matchup here um, that kicked off the feud. Wasn't too long. I don't know how long it went. It was probably like, I don't know, 9, 10 minutes. I could probably pull it up uh, on Wikipedia if I wanted to to get something, you know, roundabout accurate, but not here nor there. But I know uh, one night stand really good, and I remember Vengeance being really good as well. And I, I don't believe... Uh, I honestly think that might have been their only three matches one-on-one -on -one against each other. I don't know off the top of my head if they had any more. Uh, but Kurt Angle and Orton had a little uh, nice feud in 2006. Honestly, uh, probably could have got a little more out of it. I think the only time after that that they might have exchanged... Well, they, they had exchanged another uh, maybe tag team matches and stuff. But I know they did that Orton and Edge versus Angle and I believe RVD on the first ECW episode. 
Uh, that's not here or there, regardless. But <laughs> anyway, talking about Kurt Angle and Randy Orton, I'm going off on a t- tangent. But oh well, that's a podcaster for as I look down at my microphone again. But uh, all throughout this matchup, Kurt Angle was looking for the ankle lock. He was pissed off at Randy Orton for being the one that got pinned at WrestleMania 22, costing him the world championship. And uh, he wanted to snap Randy Orton's ankle, very apparent, as he was teasing it throughout the match, throughout the match, and eventually build it up uh, to the finish, which was nice. But Angle took a real nasty belly to belly uh, that was like. Throw, like, it was like a throw over the top rope. It wasn't even like a full belly to belly almost uh, to the outside. I believe he might landed like running his ankles. I think he like kind of looked, it kind of looked like he like twisted his knees. It was pretty nasty. Um, and then right after that, uh, I think Orton, uh, or Orton was, Angle got up on the apron, uh, cause Orton was looking for Kenna. Angle got up on the apron. I think they were, you know, kind of brawling for a second. Angle, uh, or no, Orton tried suplexing Kurt Angle into the ring. Angle counters, suplexes Randy Orton, and just kind of throws him. Angle doesn't go down with him. He just suplexes him over the top and just throws him down to the ground. So back-to-back, both guys taking nasty bumps to the outside, uh, which was sick. And I wrote down here, Orton, like, landed on his feet, but then immediately, like, fight, uh, face-planted. Uh, it was pretty nasty, and I literally wrote down back-to-back nasty landings because uh, I'm a professional at taking notes. Uh, but anyway, nice little... Uh, uh, well, excuse me, exchange here, Orton countered the uh, angle slam into a backbreaker, uh, that like neckbreaker, backbreaker that he always does, a classic Randy Orton move, uh, always so badass, though, especially when they Angle and Orton had their couple matches and Orton would counter the angle slam into that move, super badass, but anyway, Orton goes for the RKO, Angle counters by literally just slamming Orton down to the mat, uh, and then hits the, uh, locks in the ankle lock, Orton taps out, you think it's going to be done, uh, Angle doesn't let up for a few seconds, eventually gets him off. Uh, Angle wins the match, obviously, and then after that, goes back for the ankle lock, locks it in again, breaks it again, leaves uh, off the entrance, and comes back to the ring and <laughs> locks in the ankle lock for the third time, uh, and then the uh, referees and stuff eventually broke him off. Uh, but this is where Kurt Angle, uh, you know, KFA broke Randy Orton's ankle, uh, again, to right Randy Orton off television uh, for the suspension. But it was an awesome way to kick off the tournament, uh, especially because Angle and Orton already had heat, like I said, going into this matchup. So it just added an extra layer uh, on top of the fact that it was the opening round uh, of King of the Rings. So Orton and Angle kicking it off um, on April 14th. Angle moves on. It was really good stuff. Uh, moving on, and like I said, this is probably, honestly, my favorite match. Might have even been, I got to look up the King of the Ring. Uh, you know, that year. I want to see matches. Let me go down to the tournament. Uh, I was able to click <laughs> from Judgment Day, but no, Benoit and Finley was actually the longest uh, quarterfinal matchup. Matt Hardy, Booker T was next at uh, 15 minutes, and since I already mentioned it, Angle and Orton was 8 minutes and 13 seconds, according uh, to Wikipedia. But we moved on, anyway, to April 21st in St. Louis, Missouri, and this is actually one of those uh, SmackDowns where they must have recorded the same night uh, as Raw, because they were rocking the Raw entrance that night. I used to not love when they did that, but I thought it was cool, because it was just like, oh, it's a different atmosphere, you know, black ropes, because they would just share... You know, the black robes for the night Raw and SmackDown when they did the double tapings and SmackDown just used Raw's entrance, but with the SmackDown graphics. Uh, not, I didn't think it was like super like, oh my god, this is so awesome, or like better than the fifth stage or anything for SmackDown, but I always thought it was cool and unique. Uh, you know, nowadays they obviously just both look the same since they're one big LED screen, but that's nor here nor there. We actually kicked off the SmackDown um, with a nice little, this match kicked off the show, but... Right beforehand, they had a nice little uh, backstage promo, which is kind of similar to what AEW does uh, with, like, the dueling promos back and forth that kind of kicked off the show and got you hyped uh, for the opening matchup, which I thought was uh, pretty cool. You don't see that anymore from WWE. kind of see it mostly uh, from All Elite Wrestling. But Matt Hardy versus Booker T, like I said, this match went about 15 minutes. And uh, the majority of the time, man, Booker T was pretty much just dominating this matchup. Matt fought back a couple times. Uh, literally every time, Booker would just cut him off, cut him off, cut him off. Uh, eventually, Matt goes for the twist of feint. Booker pushed him off. Charmel pulls down the top rope. Matt just spills to the outside. Uh, and then, again, just Booker T just controlling most of this matchup. Uh, Matt eventually gets the advantage back. Uh, a few minutes later, Superflex, Superplex excuse me, from the top rope. Again, Booker T cuts him off and uh, kills his momentum. Eventually, Matt Hardy goes... For the twist of faint, but Charmel, yeah, Charmel, dastardly, always getting up on the apron, uh, and distracting the ref, son of a bitch, uh, gets up on the apron, distracts the ref, Booker, low blows Matt Hardy, scissors kick, Booker T steals the win, and, uh, like I said, I, it was a pretty, you know, well-paced matchup, Booker, uh, controlled most of it, Matt Hardy showed his signs of life, you thought he was gonna finally win it in the end, but Charmel got involved, and Booker, you know, uh, stole the victory here, but it was a really nice matchup, man, I really enjoyed it, um, you know, it was my style of wrestling. You know, this is just my, I really like just storytelling uh, style of wrestling. And that's what this was, man. It was a nice 15 minute, like I said, uh, you know, good matchup. And Matt Hardy, man, I got to talk about Matt Hardy because 
You know, I, I thought about this in the promo uh, that opened the show and they had the dueling uh, backstage promos and Matt Hardy whipped out the I will not die uh, line. But I just, I don't know how WWE didn't capitalize on the, on the popularity of Matt Hardy in 2005 uh, in 2006, because this guy was, was red hot, especially in 2005. I think it may have cooled off a little bit in 2006, but he was still super popular, man. Like, I'm not saying Matt Hardy would have went on and been world champion during this time, because this was the days of John Cena, Batista, Triple H, the big guy, the, the big guys. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. The big guys on top, which I'm fine with, but Matt Hardy definitely could have been U.S. champ at the time. You know, obviously, uh, who was U.S. champ at this time? Uh, been while I was with Finley. I need to go back to Judgment Day. Who, who the hell? Oh, JBL was U.S. champ at the time, but he was feuding with Rey Mysterio. He didn't need to be U.S. champ. I think he eventually dropped it to Lashley, who dropped it to, I think, Finley. Uh, or some, I don't even know. But point is, there was a whole, you know, slew of champions from, honestly, this point up until Benoit got back involved with the title when he came back. Uh, but there's no reason, I don't think, Matt Hardy couldn't have been U.S. champ during this time. You know, especially since 2006, he really didn't do much on SmackDown besides the end of the year uh, where him and Gregory Helms had a really nice feud, honestly, with a couple of really good matches, uh, which was cool because Gregory Helms was the Cruiserweight champ at the time. He wasn't even defending the title in the feud with his former friend at the time, Matt Hardy. It was just, you know, a story between those two, not even with the title, which was still really good. And then eventually, of course, Jeff Hardy came back in August. They, you know, reunited the Hardy boys uh, first at Survivor Series and then eventually uh, post-WrestleMania 23, they, you know, had another run back together. But I really wish they would have capitalized on you know just how, how hot Matt Hardy was in 2005 and 2006 again I'm not saying he could have been the main event uh you know especially with you know how stacked the main event scene was between Raw and SmackDown at the time he had a lot of great options uh but you know definitely with how you saw the U.S. title kind of swap from one person to another to another until Benoit eventually came back um like I said post No Mercy uh earlier in this podcast and then you know held it for I think till May of 07 where he dropped it to the MVP there was a big gap in there with the U.S. title just kind of moving along from mid-card guy to mid-card guy to, you know, whoever. Matt Hardy easily could have been uh, in that fray, you know, instead of JBL holding the title hostage from uh, WrestleMania, you know, 22 up until May or June. Uh, would I guess June because May you know was basically uh, you know taken up by Judgment Day. So I think you want to drop it in June. Uh, don't you know? Don't quote me on that. Might have been July. I don't know. But instead of him holding the title hostage, really for no reason other than just to have it um, and be you know Mr. America against Rey Mysterio and his feud at Judgment Day, they could have capitalized on Matt Hardy and you know Matt Hardy could have been defending the U.S. title and could have had another body uh, on SmackDown because you remember at the time Batista was out with an injury. Uh, Angles eventually go in ECW come June. Orton got you know suspended. Uh, and then Benoit was out. Like, you look at, like, Great American Bash 2006. That's a pretty rough show. Uh, not because, you know, the, the guys who were on the show didn't put on great matches or, you know, at least tried to, but there just really wasn't much, you know, top talent, really not a lot of bodies. And Matt Hardy was, was pretty hot at the time. I think they should have taken advantage. But nonetheless, Booker T versus Matt Hardy, really good matchup, uh, my favorite match of the first round. We move on to April the 28th in London, actually. And another another awesome thing, you know, we had back-to-back -back weeks with no fifth stage, um, which was just cool. It was unique because every time they went to London, uh, or not even just London, but overseas, you know, they went to Japan, did the same thing. They had the special setup for Raw and SmackDown with the two flags on the side and, you know, some, some accessories on the, on the entrance and stuff. I always used to love uh, when they did that. Again, nowadays it's just... Same old, same old. You can't even tell what arena and what location they're in. Uh, none of them uh, look unique because they all just have the one big uh, LED stage. Everything is very, you know, uh, uniform, I guess you could say. But it was, it was cool. You know, they were uh, in London, had the uh, <clears throat> special stage uh, for it, which I thought was cool. Uh, but again, Bobby Lashley versus Mark Henry. Bobby Lashley got a huge pop uh, when he came out. Bobby Lashley over, uh, at least in my opinion, you know, from what I heard from watching these couple of matches uh, at the time. Huge pop from the London crowd, uh, and it definitely was an organic pop. You know, you can tell nowadays when it's clearly piped in crowd noises. This is organic as it can be, in my opinion, but also, random thought <laughs> while I was watching this. Uh, how the hell, and I put this on Twitter last night or two nights ago when I was watching this as well, how the hell is Bobby Lashley literally not aged at all? He was, I did the math, he was 29, uh, or at least going to be 30, going to be 30, I don't know when his birthday was, I didn't look at that, uh, his birthday, but let's just call it 29. He was 29 in 2006, he's 45 now, he looks exactly the same, nothing has changed at all, he doesn't look a, a day older, a, like literally, he, it's, the, it's the same person. It's Bobby Lashley at 29 and Bobby Lashley at 45. They're the same person. The only thing that's different in 2022 is that he wears different attire now. But literally, I don't know how Bobby Lashley has not aged 
one bit. I just, I had to point that out because I'm just watching this match and I'm like, how the hell does this guy look the same at 29 that he does at 45? Like, even, like, Edge, it looks great for his age. What's he, almost 50, 49, 48, 49? I don't know. But clearly looks different than he did in 2006. Honestly, probably looks better uh, and in better shape. But Bobby Lashley is literally a carbon copy. Like, nothing changed. I don't, I don't know how. It's, uh, it's freaking insane. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, this match didn't go too long. This match, let me go back to the tournament bracket here on wikipedia it only went five minutes uh mark henry controlled the first few minutes eventually bobby lashley fought back and crowd was popping huge for big bob let me tell you he was over in a uh, good old uh uk but anyway uh mark henry hit i believe a big power slam uh on bobby lashley i think that was you know cutting him off after he was trying to you know build some momentum eventually uh what do i pull here lashley pulls down i think mark henry is running uh, like at Bobby Lashley, maybe to just tackle him or something, close on him out of the ring. Bobby Lashley pulled down the top rope. Henry takes a spill over the top rope to the outside. I think he may even might have hit his head on the announce table. Not sure. And Bobby, Bobby Lashley gets the win. Mark Henry gets counted out. Literally five minutes. Uh, not too much in those five minutes. Just, you know, was what it was. Got got the win by count out. Obviously, they looked like they were trying to protect Mark Henry here because after the match, Mark Henry did a post-match attack on Bobby Lashley. Uh, he was, like, leaning up against the ring post, hit him with a splash, just laid him out. And then later in the night is when they actually, I believe it was Kurt Angle versus Rey Mysterio uh, on the SmackDown. And this is when they kicked off, um, or reignited, I should say, since they had feuded earlier in 2006, the Mark Henry and uh, Kurt Angle feud for Judgment Day. Mark Henry did the splash off the apron through the table uh, to Kurt, sending Kurt Angle through the table, which was a sixth spot. And... Uh, that kicked off their feud for Judgment Day and actually takes Kurt, takes Kurt Angle out of the tournament because uh, he is not is forced to not compete and first, forced to forfeit uh, two weeks later against Booker T. But again, I really think, I, I wish there was, there might be knowledge of it out there, but I doubt it. Uh, I really think we probably would have got Orton versus Angle at Judgment Day that year um, had Orton not got suspended. I wonder, I wonder what Mark Henry would have did. I don't know. Maybe it would have been him and Lashley or... Maybe he would have been the one cost to Bobby Lashley the finals at Judgment Day instead of Finley, which we'll talk about. I'm not sure, but, you know, uh, you can always wonder, right? Uh, but anyway, moving on, we had, <clears throat> excuse me, May the 5th in Cincinnati, Ohio. Not sure why I did that. Uh, we had Chris Benoit versus Finley, which, I mean, you can you can read them and weep. Uh, this is obviously the most physical matchup, and it was the longest matchup. 21 minutes and 9 seconds, according to Wikipedia. And uh, like I said, definitely the most physical matchup of the uh, first round. These two beat the shit, 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 shit out of each other. Uh, literally, they were grappling for the first few minutes. Went face to face. Finley starts beating the hell. I, I think he like clotheslined Benoit right into the face to face. Uh, fin Finley was kind of, I think, working on Benoit a lot in the early going, working on the left arm of Benoit. Uh, that probably sounded loud on the microphone. I just slapped the hell out of my left arm uh, <laughs> to the point where Benoit uh, got busted open. I don't even remember how he got busted open, but he did somehow. Uh, eventually, after these guys, you know, got done beating the shit out of each other for 15, 16 minutes, <laughs> whatever it was up to this point, uh, Benoit hit. Let me not get the low power off my phone. It, it'll survive. It's fine. Uh, ben White hit the three Germans. Goes for the headbutt. Finley moves out of the way. Uh, I How many... <laughs> It's a shame, honestly, but how many missed headbutts did Benoit hit over the years? It's a, it's a shame. But anyway, Finley moves out of the way. Finley grabs um, his shillelagh, uh, and I think Benoit sends him over the top rope. And then I think Benoit might have grabbed the shillelagh, and the ref grabbed it at, grabbed it out of his hand. Um, and then as the ref turned turned away to go get rid of the shillelagh, Benoit goes after Finley at ringside. But Finley pulled out a chair, jabbed Benoit on the side of the head of it, uh, goes in, hits his finisher. I forget what it's called. Uh... I don't, I don't know, Celtic something, I don't, I don't know. The point is, whatever Finley's finisher at the time was called, he hit that and then got the win. So Finley defeats Chris Benoit in the first round. I'm sure that was probably surprising uh, to many at the time. Uh, I don't know what my reaction was because it was a long time ago. I was about to say it was this number of years ago, but I can't do that quick math. Uh, what? A, let's see if I can do it. Don't care. Uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get a good, I didn't get a good, grade in, in math um in school in case in case you were wondering uh but yeah uh where, where were we <laughs> finley defeats chris benoit um in the opening match and then like i said this is definitely a hell of a matchup they beat the hell out of each other for 20 minutes um but i don't i don't really know like why in comparison to this and the booker t matt hardy match why i enjoyed booker versus matt hardy more i think it's just because there was a more uh story to it throughout the matchup but even though there was here like fin they like yeah they were just beating the shit out of each other for a lot of it but also finley was working on the arm benoit had to work through that like there's a good story here as well uh but i think for some reason my favorite match of the first round would be booker t and matt hardy but obviously a close second would be 
Benoit and Finley. And then after that would obviously be Angle Orton. And then Lashley versus Mark Henry uh, was five minutes and ended on a count out. So can't really count it too much. But that would uh, conclude the uh, first round of the tournament. Did I say? Oh, yeah, Cincinnati. Ohio. I was about to say, did I say where that match took place? I was pretty sure I did. But nonetheless, uh, we move on to May the 12th. In San Diego, California, Rey Mysterio's hometown, which I believe this is the night he faced Greg Holly and lost to the Greg Holly um, in his hometown, which, uh, again, Rey Mysterio, I was so happy at the time that he got a world championship reign, and I didn't even realize it because I was so young, but man, did he just get booked like crap during his world title reign, man. Uh, absolute shame. I think I'll definitely put that up my notes to do one day, uh, rebooking Rey Mysterio's world championship run. I also want to do a video, uh, or maybe it'll be a podcast, I don't know, uh, talking about rvd's wwe championship run which happened obviously two months after basically what the time we're talking about um or one month whatever uh one night stand obviously it ended real early because he i don't know if i don't even know if rvd ended up getting suspended but him and sabu got busted for smoking weed or some shit uh and then they forced forced the title off him he literally lost the wwe and the ecw title back-to-back -back nights i think uh had like a three-week reign whatever it was uh so i, I think i want to do that eventually again whether it's a video or a podcast I think it'd be cool to kind of rebook uh, a few month uh, reign for RVD as the WWE champion. Let me know down in the YouTube comments uh, if you guys want to see that, or if you're listening to this, hit me up on social media uh, at No Nation Vlogs on Twitter and Instagram. But let's get back to the King of the Ring tournament, May the twelfth, uh, two thousand six. We are in San Diego, California, and we are set for Booker T and Kurt Angle in the semifinals. But of course, Kurt Angle cannot compete in this matchup. He has, uh, you know, because of the attack from Mark Henry, I believe he had broken ribs. They were saying uh, had to forfeit the matchup, and they actually said. And I accidentally fast forwarded through the backstage promo or I would have watched it, but I wasn't going backwards. I believe they said Kurt Angle got escorted out of the arena earlier in the night. So he couldn't even try to come out and compete uh, against Booker T, but Booker T comes out uh, to the ring full gear uh, just to do a promo. Booker T, Booker T's one eye, I forget which one it was, I think it was the left eye, was like completely bloodshot. And I was like, what the hell? I looked like you popped a bunch of blood vessels, but they actually said on commentary during the Lashley Finley match, which happened right after this, that Booker T had gotten a black eye during the SummerSlam commercial shoot, which I guess just happened, uh, you know, that, that week or something like that. I was like, okay, I thought he just, you know, got real into it and then popped a couple of blood vessels in his eye, but evidently he had a black eye. It really didn't look like a black eye, it just looked, uh, like, like his eye was just bloodshot, but I just thought it was worth noting because, I, well, I just thought it was worth noting. But nonetheless, uh, Booker T was like, Kurt, I feel bad about this, man. I'm going to give you to the count of 10 to come out here and face me or whatever he said. Uh, and then obviously Kurt Angle does not show because he's not in the arena. Uh, and then Booker T and Charmel start celebrating like they want to match up. But Michael Cole's like, oh, this is ridiculous. He's just ragging on him. Taz is like, yo, come on. That's my guy, Booker T. Uh, but nonetheless, we move on right after that. Uh, to, uh, to excuse me, Bobby Lashley and uh, Finley in the semifinals of the King of the Ring. How long did this match go? This went uh, 13 minutes and 30 seconds. Felt about uh, like that. And uh, honestly, Finley controlled most of this matchup. There really wasn't much uh, Bobby, notable Bobby Lashley offense. But again, the majority of this, I'd say, was controlled by Finley. Booker T and Charmel actually came back out. Uh, because they had left and come back, they came back out to the uh, stage like mid match, and Booker T sat uh, on the King of the Ring throne uh, that was you know on the stage for all, all the weeks during um, the King of the Ring tournament, or at least it was out there for these matches. I don't know if they kept it out for the rest of the show because I only watched the King of the Ring matches. But nonetheless, uh, one spot that I thought was pretty notable here outside of the finish. Uh, Finley was on the outside. Lashley was on the apron. Lashley just goes for this weird ass dive, like not even like a, like an ax, not even like a, he goes for the ax hammer or something or like a clothesline or shoulder block. Literally just like throws himself to the air. <laughs> I don't know why, but it made me laugh. Uh, and Booker T just, or not Booker T, Finley just pulled out the apron and Lashley basically just landed on it split style and uh, got low blowed by the apron. Uh, a legal maneuver, but you know, obviously Finley always used the aprons, which I, I loved for some reason. Uh, but yeah, I don't I don't know why but the weird ass unorthodox splash from lashley that just ended in a low blow from the apron absolutely made me laugh for some reason i just had to talk about it here uh, but besides that didn't write down much else about this matchup besides the finish uh finley couldn't put away lashley like i said he can 
controlled most of this matchup and uh, couldn't put Bobby Lashley away. They were making Bobby Lashley uh, look strong here. Uh, you know, it's funny. You know, I, I did, before this was the Ruthless Discussions YouTube channel months ago, uh, I think it was like February or March, I actually made a video talking about uh, what if Bobby Lashley never left the WWE in 2007, 2008, whatever it was. And I kind of booked a, a year's worth of uh, Bobby Lashley in the WWE because they were making Lashley look good, man. They made him look good throughout this tournament. Uh, they made him look good the remainder of 06 and 07, you know, eventually jumps to Raw. Fights John Cena for the WWE Championship, and then uh, basically fall. That's the shower turning on, by the way. If you if you hear that on the microphone, not sure if the new microphone picks that little noise up like that. But <laughs> eventually, you know, has that match with John Cena, and then basically uh, that was it for his WWE career. But had a ton of potential, man. Uh, but you know, at least we have him now, so that's good. At least in my opinion, I, I like Bobby Lashley. I'm a big Bobby Lashley fan. But anyway, going back to the Finley. And Bobby Lashley match. Finley can't put him away. Uh, eventually grabs a chair. And the shillelagh. Uh, I believe the referee gets rid of the shillelagh. Uh, Finley, behind the ref's back, hits Bobby Lashley with a chair. Bobby Lashley just absorbs the blow and just, ah, ah And then runs at Finley. Hits a big spear. Uh, just absorbing the chair shot. Hulk and up throw it. And uh, hits the spear on Finley out of nowhere. And Bobby Lashley gets the win. Book, gets the win. Excuse me. Booker T is pissed. Bobby Lashley gets on the mic. Tells him, Booker T, you're sitting in my seat. Booker gets up and leaves. He's like, I don't want no problems, Lashley. At least right now, I don't want no problems. But that was the semifinals. I wish we would have got that Kurt Angle and Booker T match. That probably would have been a hell of a matchup. I know they had, you know, had plenty of matches. Uh, or at least several matches. I don't know how many off the top of my head uh, before. Like literally the year before. Uh... Uh, 2006 and the judgment day 2005 um they had wrestled in a weird storyline involving uh charmel and kurt angle one that one that you know uh do uh do some stuff to her but <laughs> you know i still wish we would have got that matchup uh obviously would have made the tournament overall even better but is what it is i'll take a wing get i need a water break hey this is the first water break of 35 minutes that's, that's pretty impressive i gotta say and i'm not cutting it out either good age to oh man listen guys anybody out there uh you know i'm a big coffee drinker i'm addicted to the bean but you guys, i'm gonna tell you guys right now off topic but make sure you're drinking your water do that for me if, you, if you're a fan of this pot if you're enjoying today's podcast do me a favor drink a gallon of water today just do it do it for me nonetheless where were we judgment day we're getting in the judgment day, i believe not edge damian priest and rhea ripley which i love by the way but the judgment day pay-per-view um which again was may 21st in phoenix arizona at the time was the american west arena what is it now i believe it is the let's see if i click on it it is the oh it's the footprint center i thought it was the oh i thought it was still talking st okay this the, 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 it's changed a lot uh, i thought it was still talking stick resort or, or whatever but now now evidently it's the footprint center uh that that's a weird name footprint center Yo, we're going down to the Footprint Center to see the Suns game. You coming? Whatever. Uh, nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless uh, we got Judgment Day. Phoenix, Arizona. Bobby Lashley and Booker T. The finals of the King of the Ring tournament. We had an awesome video package right before this match. A recap in the whole tournament. Uh, they are playing This Fire Burns uh, by Killswitch and Gaze, which was the theme song to Judgment Day before CM Punk uh, used it um, as his theme song when he debuted uh, about a month later, but which made the theme, which made the video package um, even more awesome. Uh, it doesn't really fit these two guys, but it fits the vibe of the show, so I'm all good. It was an awesome video package, like I said, a recap in the tournament. Getting you hyped. For the finals that we have been building to towards, excuse me, for weeks. Uh, but notable stuff here. Booker T, I gotta give him some props here. He was bumping the hell. Uh, bump, it, bump it all over the place early for Bobby Lashley. I mean, suplexes, clotheslines. He was bumping his ass off for Bobby Lashley. Making the kid look good even in defeat. You gotta give him props, man. Booker T was trying to put over the kid even in defeat. You gotta give the man props but uh literally booker t uh was taking a bunch of bumps lashley clotheslined them like literally a ton like literally like four or five times in this matchup uh obviously lashley even though i thought he was you know decent for the times and w was good he's definitely way better now uh his arsenal was a little uh a little light and you, you i think you, you saw it in matches like this where he had to really progress um and the matches got a little more stretched out i, I swear to god he hit like six clotheslines uh throughout this matchup but booker t sold them all a million times man so Big credit to him, but there was a big clothesline. Booker T went for the scissors kick. Lashley closed on the shit out of him. Booker did a whole 360, uh, just making the kid look good. But eventually, Booker T hits a heel kick, uh, followed by a scissors kick. Goes for the pin. Lashley kicks out, so making him look even better in defeat. Lashley kicking out of the scissor kick. Uh, didn't happen too much, so Bobby Lashley definitely uh, looking good here. But moments later, 
He'll actually hit a spear uh, on Booker T. But right before he can go for the pinfall, Sarmel gets up on the uh, uh, it on. Cannot talk. <laughs> Sarmel gets up on the ring apron, uh, gives the distractions to the referee. Lashley's like, "What the bitch? Get down! What are you doing?" But while this is happening, Finley comes in the ring, turns Lashley around, hits him with the shillelagh, and knocks Bobby Lashley's ass out. Booker T hits Bobby Lashley with a scissors kick, and Booker T, of course, wins the King of the Ring. Like I said, I feel like maybe Mark Henry would have been in this position. Maybe they would have did a Lashley-Henry feud if Orton didn't get suspended. I'm completely just speculating there. But regardless, Finley and Lashley, you know, had some heat already from uh, Lashley beating him uh, in the semifinals. And that continued here. And eventually, Finley would kind of align himself slowly but surely with Booker T in the second half of the year. Lashley and Finley um, had their problems as well. But yeah, Finley knocks Bobby Lashley out. Booker T hits it with a scissors kick. Booker T becomes your king of the ring uh, of 2006. And king... Booker was born. And, and man, what a, what a year Booker T had in 2006. I mean, literally went from U.S. champion versus Chris Benoit. Great feud at the end of 2005 and 2006. Uh, then, unfortunately, gets uh, fed to the boogeyman at WrestleMania 22. Very interesting decision. Still don't know why uh, that was the route they uh, they went. I guess they just wanted to make, you know, boogeyman look good. But regardless, he bounces back strong from that big loss. He wins King of the Ring. Looks good doing it. You know, gives Bobby Lashley, uh, honestly, the rub here. You know, even in defeat, Bobby Lashley looked good. Booker T moves on. King Booker is born. And, I mean, if anybody sold the King gimmick, you know, WWE loves to give people the King gimmick nowadays. You know, we've gotten King Sheamus. We've gotten King Corbin. We've gotten uh, King Woods. Uh, and all these people who've won King of the Ring in the last, let's just say, 10 years or whatever. But Booker T, man, if anybody adopted the King gimmick and absolutely ran with it, and made it actually entertaining and not just, you know, stupid and cringeworthy. It was Booker T, man. Give this man, as everybody likes to say now, ever since CM Punk said it a year ago, or not a year ago, but like back in his return promo last year. If you want to give somebody their flowers, here, give this man his flowers, man. Booker T, man. Obviously, everybody knew he was already entertaining. He was hilarious. He could give you serious. He could give you funny. Booker T was a great superstar all around. Great wrestler overall. Uh, but, man, talk about taking the King gimmick and just absolutely running with it, man. That's exactly what Booker T did in 2006. Won the King of the Ring. King Booker was born. That was May 21st by the Great American Bash, which I want to look up what uh, what was the date of. Let me got to get through One Night Stand. And when was July 23rd? So, May 21st. Gets to July 23rd, Booker T's winning, or excuse me, King Booker is winning the World Heavyweight Championship. And then honestly, you know, I, I gotta give WWE a little, you know, little knock here because Booker did so well in 2006. Um, and, you know, it was a great story. And you know, I'm a huge Batista fan with Batista coming back uh, mid year. Uh, you know, of course, he had to relinquish the World Heavyweight Championship in Philadelphia in January of 2006. And then he wins back the World Heavyweight Championship in Philadelphia at Survivor Series 2006. And then, you know, Booker and Batista feuded literally from August to basically December that year of 2006. They were the two main guys on SmackDown. But after that, man, after that feud, Booker uh, Booker fell off uh, to no fault of his own. He was doing great. I mean, I think they feud, put him in a feud with Kane. Uh, and then he was in Money in the Bank at WrestleMania. And I don't remember much else after that. I think he, they moved him to Raw. He might have been in. I think he was in that, uh, like, championship five-man challenge or whatever they called it at, at Vengeance, uh, which was the first night of champions also in 07 with Cena and Foley, Orton, Lashley. Uh, but yeah, I think he was the fifth guy in there. And then after that, he uh, he lost to Triple H at Mania that year. Uh, and then he left WWE. I don't even know off the top of my head. Somebody can fill me in. I know I'm sure the story's out there and I'm sure he shared uh, why before. But I don't even know personally why uh, he left uh, the WWE in 2007. I'm sure he had his reasons, obviously. Uh, but I got to be honest, WWE, I would say... Completely dropped the ball because, listen, he got the world title run. He got King of the Ring. He was still a relevant player on SmackDown and Raw in 2007, but definitely took a decline once, you know, Batista came back and the field started getting, uh, you know, widened out. What am I trying to say now? Widened out. <laughs> uh, th I don't, what the hell is the word I'm looking for? I don't know. But point is, you know, Batista came back. Other players left, but, you know, you had Benoit back on SmackDown. Some new players came in. MVP, Mr. Kennedy was getting hot. WWE was investing in other people, uh, and unfortunately, it almost kind of seemed like they invested in Booker T just because they were lacking of options almost uh, in 2006. But Booker T was great, man, uh, and I wish they would have uh, 
at least capitalized a little more uh, on how great of work he did in 2006 and 2007. Even, even if it was just another U.S. title run or uh, moving him to Raw, giving him the IC title, like whatever, whatever. I mean, they weren't really doing much with the IC title in the first half of 07, uh, to my knowledge. I want to say Jeff Hardy actually might have been champ. Uh, it was Jeff and Nitro at the end of 06. So I think Jeff was champ, but then Jeff, you know, was in Money in the Bank. He, he put the Hardys back together. Putting the inter, 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 Intercontinental title, excuse me, on Booker T in 07 would have probably been a great idea. Um, but, you know, you can go back and look at the cards, or not look, look at the cards, look at the roster and how things played out. And I'm just, real, I'm just you know, bullshitting fantasy off the top of my head. But listen, point is, Booker T, he took the King gimmick. He absolutely ran with it. He had a great 2006 King of the Ring world champion. Uh, you know, pretty good feud with Batista from what I remember. Uh, and obviously, I was actually there uh, at, at Survivor Series 2006, which was my second show I ever attended for Batista and Booker T. Uh, so I saw, you know, the cap to that feud. I know they continued it, and they had a couple more matches on SmackDown. They had the Batista and Cena versus Booker and Finley and Armageddon that year. Uh, but that was, you know, the peak of, of the feud where Batista won the world title back. But still, Booker T had a great 2006. Wish they would have kept that momentum going a little bit into 2007, but... Oh well, it's uh this light just died on me. This light just died on me. We got somebody not paying the electric around here. What are we doing? No, <laughs> this one's still good. This one's dead. This is the shitty one, isn't it? Yep, it's the shitty one. Uh, regardless, whatever. But point is, Booker T. I'm rolling with what we got. It's not. It's, it's not too bad. I'm sorry if I look sweaty here. Uh, I actually went to the gym before I started recording this podcast, and I knew I was gonna get hot, so I was like, I'm not gonna shower yet. I did clean my face and then wash my hands and put deodorant on, even though you guys can't smell me. But <laughs> I did not shower yet uh, post gym, so I'm sweating uh, my my freaking nuts off uh, in here right now. But Bo Booker T won this thing, uh, and then actually post match there was a little quick segment. Booker T was sitting on the throne. Bobby Lashley speared him through the throne, and I got uh, again. Was, we're giving Booker T some credit here, man. He sold it like a million bucks. He literally sold this spear like he like he was about to die. Like he literally was like. Ah! Ah, and he was going cross-eyed and shit and Charmel was like stay with me stay with me I was I was cracking up I Booker T man what a, what a freaking awesome awesome dude and how much how long excuse me did this um finals go it went nine minutes and 15 seconds I about felt like that because uh, I literally wrote on my notes really solid 10 minute it seemed like match that is exactly what my notes said but that was it man that was the 2006 king of the ring and from my perspective from my viewing entertainment uh you know watching this really this whole tournament for the first time since it happened in 2006 i definitely watched judgment day like two three years ago yeah i think it was 2020 when we were all sitting at home i watched this judgment day so it hasn't been too long since i watched this lashley and booker t uh but you know like knocked in the, I, my now my phone's on 10 percent. We, we gotta wrap this up <laughs> anyway uh i really enjoyed this tournament i'm not saying you guys are gonna go check it out i mean i just gave you the results i spoiled it for you but it'll definitely you know be worth checking out going through uh you know and finding the smackdowns on peacock and, and simming through them like i did to watch uh the tournament i really enjoyed it and uh it was something different like i said at the beginning of this i wanted to just talk about something kind of overall uh not just one specific show so i was like you know what the 2006 king of the ring spanned it over a couple weeks uh and then you know i haven't watched literally since so i thought it was a, a good idea and it was a fun viewing i'm glad i did it so next week i think we're gonna do judgment day 03 i don't know why but i've just been having the itch to watch that show i said it last week here on the ruthless discussions podcast and we were talking about the uh first smackdown with the uh under the wwe name is the first smackdown that batista made his debut on so go check that out if you didn't check it out last week uh, but like i said next week i think we're going to talk about judgment day 2003 i'm pretty excited for it lesnar and uh, big show uh in the uh what what the hell was it? Stru was it no? It wasn't a structure match. Uh, was it that? I don't I don't remember what the hell the stipulation was. But point is, I'm pretty pumped up to watch it. So I hope you guys will be joining me next Sunday because we'll be talking about a little 2003 Judgment Day. But I hope you guys enjoyed this week's podcast. I really appreciate you guys checking it out right here on the Ruthless Discussions YouTube channel. And if you listen on any of the audio platforms, I appreciate that as well.